Hello, I'm Paul Peterson, and I'm here with Eric Hanyashek. We're both senior fellows at the Hoover Institution and members of the CRET Task Force on K-12 Education. And uh, we just wanted to talk a bit about uh, what school districts are doing when they have to cut their budgets. And uh, in the previous discussion, we talked about whether or not there really is a fiscal crisis, but let's just assume that there is or that there soon will be. And that, in fact, the economy won't do quite as well mm -hmm. as we would like and that uh, the school districts really have to cut. So where are they making these cuts these days? How are they trying to get their budgets into balance? Well, this is such an unusual event for schools. We basically haven't cut budgets in 100 years for schools. and. While there's been a lot of talk about fis fiscal constraints, they haven't been real. But this year, there might be a number of states where the budget cuts are real. California is one, New Jersey is another, uh, Colorado is another, where the budgets actually look like they might decrease. Well, we've, uh, states are still trying to figure out what to do. The schools are gaming it in some sense to try to lobby for larger funding, but it's not always going to happen. So in California, for example, we have what I think is the worst uh, way to cut budgets or deal with these fiscal problems. Um, the California legislature, in anticipation of fiscal problems over the fall next year, declared that no school district in California can reduce the number of teachers it has to so, deal with fiscal problems. So if, if you have fewer students, you have to keep all your teachers nonetheless? Uh, um, I'm a little bit unsure about fewer students, but I know that they cannot, in anticipation of budget problems, cut teachers. So what is possible? Well, you can think of cutting other things, but one of the approved cuts in California is that they can reduce the school year by up to seven days. So that way you would cut teachers' salaries, right? They would teach seven days less, and then they would get seven days less pay. And so, well, what's so bad about that? You don't learn anything the last seven days of the year anyhow, do you? There's always a last seven days of the year, and that's <laughs> the problem, is that they just move the last seven days earlier. Now the other... And besides that, the state tests come before the last seven days. <laughs> <laughs> so you'll do just as well on the state that, tests. That could be. Now the other possibility that people have been getting a lot of press about is that they just let class sizes rise a little bit, that they cut a few teachers or don't hire as many teachers as they would have and let class size rise. And people have been talking about how that is a potentially huge impact by my calculations, that could be a great gain if you reduce the teachers in the best way possible. If you got rid of the least effective teachers, we could actually come out of this recession with higher achievement because we would have all the kids being taught by better teachers. So you're saying that every day counts <clears throat> in school, or at least we have good reason. There's some data out there to say that extending the school year or at least keeping the school year where it is, is a good idea. And there's very little evidence that uh, one student change in class size would be costly in terms of education. In fact, it could even make things better if you let the weakest teachers go. That's precisely the argument, is that the weakest teachers are really dragging down achievement in the U.S. and that if we can find a way to replace the weakest teachers with just an average teacher, not a superstar, we could dramatically increase our achievement. We could get up to the level of Canada or maybe even Finland if we got rid of the bottom five to eight percent of our teachers. Well, isn't that what most businesses do? When they in a recession, they're losing money, they cut their workforce and they cut the weakest members of the workforce and they become a more efficient operation. They come back in and usually the economy is much more productive after a recession than any other time. Why don't we do that in education? Well, that's precisely the difference between education, which hasn't made decisions on the basis of what it's doing on achievement of students, but has been making decisions on other grounds all along. If we acted more business-like, which is a bad name in education for some reason, we could uh, dramatically improve the situation for our schools. Well, we talked a couple times ago about uh, proficiency and how, how well students are doing. And uh, 
one of the ways we could uh, make our schools work so much more effectively is taking some uh, old-fashioned business principles and applying them to our schools. Well, and hopefully we could. Um, the current activities of states to uh, look at how schools uh, are ruled and governed like Wisconsin and Illinois and Indiana and so forth um, actually have not gotten into the issue of making sure that the schools are actually producing the most achievement. If they get to that point, we could actually see great improvements in our schools. Well, thank you, Rick. It's been great chatting with you, and I look forward to doing it again before long.